Welcome, everyone, to the Governor's House. I'm Larry Sharp, running for Governor of New York in 2018. This year, November 2018, November 6th, we can turn New York gold. And if we turn New York gold, we will turn the nation gold. You want to talk to me tonight? No worries. 877-480-4120. Call, ask me a question. I'll answer it, even if I don't want to. I will still answer it either way, because that's what I do. I'm here for you guys every Wednesday from 9 to 10. Look, um... I was upstate New York last four last four days, Syracuse, um, outside of Utica, Albany, and one thing I really noticed was what's the word I'm going to use? A grayness in a way. When I mean a grayness, I mean a feeling that maybe there's a bit of hopelessness. People who are just kind of moving forward through things. I thought it was only in New York City, and this is kind of interesting. In New York City, I always know something recently, within the last, I don't know, five years or so. Less people are in a rush. Now, if you've been in New York City for many years, like I have, uh, when you, 10 years ago, you're out there, people are rocking and rolling and moving, and you're in the way, and get out of my way, guy, and was moving. Now, not so much. I thought it was just New York City. But when I went upstate, I, I kind of found a similar thing, but for a different reason. What I found a big deal upstate is that they are watching their youth leave. It's what I'm calling youth flight. They're watching people come here to get educated. That's awesome. They go to one of the great schools in Syracuse or Rochester or, or Ithaca. They go to a great school out there. Awesome. Good for them. Albany, Buffalo, and then they leave. They get some form of degree or training or don't even finish sometimes. Then they leave. But the people stay, this is the heart of people stay, are often those who feel like they have no choice. They feel like there's nothing left. Those are often the people who don't even finish high school because they figure, why bother? Those people who don't go out and look for a good job because they figure, why bother? But something else. When I was talking to people in local businesses, you guys know I like the businesses and I'm happy to go in and talk to them. And I spent some time talking to local businesses. What I also felt was the idea that why bother voting? Most of you may not may not know that about 60 to 70 percent of New Yorkers don't vote. Huge voter apathy. This is called learned helplessness. This means we've learned that there's no chance. So why bother? It's why a lot of people don't even bother leaving. Matthew says, and this is perfect, too broke to stay, too broke to leave. Matthew, I couldn't have said it better myself. This is what people are feeling. They're in such a bad spot, they actually can't leave, but they're in such a bad spot, they actually can't stay, they can't do either. So they get stuck, and they just sit there. And every single time government comes up with something to change and make things better, it winds up making things worse. And it's that one thing that makes it really hurt. Now, even in New York City, we see it. We see that about 30% of New Yorkers, New York people who live in New York City, aren't born in the country. And about, and about 30% of other people who are in New York aren't even born in New York City. So a lot of New York City people leave too. We don't want to deal with the rat race. People are coming here to get that opportunity and then they leave. We have to have an environment where people want to stay. I need people to want to stay and bribing them to stay is not the answer. Giving them opportunity, giving them hope. Something to remember when people feel hope, that's when a revolution comes. When people feel hope. That's what I want. So youth flight is a big issue. Here's something most of you also don't know. About one third of New York is on Medicaid. And there are many counties in upstate New York particularly, one third is on, on Medicaid and one third's on Medicare. Wow, of course the youth are leaving. Why wouldn't they? This is the place that we are right now. New York is ranked at the bottom in almost every way you look at economic indicators and growth. It's a problem. So let me grab a couple calls. Um, let's see. Uh, on line one, I have Andrew. Andrew, go ahead. Andrew, can I hear you? I can't hear you. Can you hear Hi. me? Larry? Ah, oh, there you are. Go ahead, my friend. Holy crap. Hi, Larry. Um, so is the, I watched the um, 
the speech today, the kind of conversation everyone was having with President Trump. And I'm kind of curious, you know, do we put more, you know, secure people that can defend our children in the schools, which will technically cost, you know, taxpayers more money, or do we just try to limit people's rights, which that can, you know, obviously cause mass um, mass killings like there's been in the Soviet Union or, you know, Nazi Germany, where you have such strong governments that can do this. So what, what's the answer? Well, it's funny, you know, when I teach leadership, I talk about decision making. I actually do a full day class on decision making and critical thinking. And one of the first rules when you do this, when you start to think about how do you solve a problem, one of the first things is verify data. You want to verify what's true and what's not true. And you verify this for one important reason. Very often when people begin to pose a question, they frame the question as you just did, as if there are only two options. We either become Nazi Germany or we become a prison. Uh, I'm teasing you, obviously. But the issue is I don't want to put more guns in schools. I don't want to put less guns in schools. My point is guns aren't the issue. The issue is, and this is the most important piece, unhappy people. There are two things that most of these people, well, one thing they don't have, one thing they do have. The one thing most of them do have is a prescription of psychotropic drugs. Now, does that mean if you're on drugs, you're a bad person? Of course not. But those drugs are often used because people are depressed. They feel bad. They're sad, right? Very often. And the second thing that they don't have is a girlfriend. They don't have positive relationships. They don't feel good. Now, you don't have to have only romantic, obviously, but you want to have romantic and, uh, and family and friends. You want all those things. The problem is someone says, but Larry, if they have guns, they'll shoot lots of people. I hear that all the time. Here's the problem. What if there were all of a sudden tomorrow no guns? Okay, great. What will, what will this kid do? Remember, the last kid who did this, he literally pulled the fire alarm to get everybody in the hallway so he can shoot them easier. He thought this through. He didn't just randomly do it. He thought it. So he doesn't have a gun now. What does he do? He pulls the fire alarm. Everyone runs out into the parking lot. He runs them down with a truck. I'm not making that up. That happened in Nice in France. 80 some odd people died because of that. That is more than any shooting we've ever had in America. So take the guns away. They'll run them down. The point is he wants to kill people. So if someone tells me, Larry, but with your guns, I don't want them shooting, shooting all the students. Great. What weapon would you prefer? What do you want? Mm -hmm. You tell me what weapon you want sorry, to use. I've actually, um, sorry to cut you off, but I've actually, you know, thought of this. I'm usually, I'm usually more on the conservative side when it comes to firearms. Yeah. And I, I do like, you know, sporting, but I think the next thing we're going to see really is an attack in this country with a gas truck. It's, it's really, I don't like, doubt it. You think about, you know, 9-11 happened. It yep. was just, you know, a moving giant ton, ton plane that can move 100 miles an hour. Absolutely. You have a truck. You can, you don't really need, you can just hijack it real quick and it's a moving bomb. Andrew, yeah, I have the answer. Just, Andrew, I have the answer. If any truck has more than two axles, if it has three axles or more, it's an assault truck. And we'll ban it. <laughs> That's what we'll do. Three axles or more, that's an assault truck. Let's ban it. We've solved our problems, Andrew, you and I. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you, Larry. All righty. I have uh, Ryan on line two. Ryan, how are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Larry, I'm curious. Um, when you're elected, you're likely to face a uh, tough legislative environment. Not um, likely. Guaranteed. So, um. Just what, what would your first couple of uh, initiatives be, knowing that you probably have a divided legislature to work with? Um, what do you think you could really build consensus around? No, it's a great point. Um, the issue is it's not likely, my friend. It's guaranteed. I mean, there's no doubt that when I become the governor, I'm going to have an assembly against me, a Senate against me, probably the press against me, too. Right now, the press is pretty nice because, you know, I'm an anomaly. They give me a lot of attention. They're being nice to me. And I get it. And I hope they'll, they will always be nice to me. That would be amazing. Got a feeling it's not going to happen. Probably they're going to start beating me up as soon as they think I actually have a shot at winning, which is great. That'll probably happen in the next month or two. They'll figure this out. And that's awesome. That's great. And they'll beat me up. So I will have all of that against me. You're correct. But here's there are certain things that I can do. And believe it or not, I'm, I'm going to follow. And some of you will be angry, but I'm going to follow the Gary Johnson model, which is use what you can use legally as the executive. The executive does have power and use the executive power. And there are several things I can do. The first thing is I can prioritize enforcement of laws, right? I enforce them. I will prioritize the enforcement. And guess what I'm not going to prioritize really high? Regulations on small businesses. Not the big regulations, the small ones, the ones like, 
hey, do I really want to send people to con be concerned about whether someone has a hair braiding license? Those types of things we have to just get rid of. Not just that, we have to talk about things like, what can I do with people who be, have been victims of the SAFE Act? Well, I can pardon those people. Yes, I said victims of the SAFE Act, people who've been arrested and now have had their lives ruined by a very terrible law. I can do things like that. Now, this goes into two separate offices that I can build out. One is called the Office of the Repeal, which means I will actually have people going through these regulations that are clearly not helpful at all and figure out which ones I should deprioritize in enforcing. Means don't enforce for several months, but deprioritize in, in enforcing. Now, the thing is, many of these assembly people, they actually know, the assembly men and the senators, they actually know these are bad. But if they actually try to stop it and something bad happens, well, they're going to be punished for it. Here's the glory of me being the bad guy already from the bat. I don't care. I'm going to spend every single day as governor being attacked by both sides and by the press. Do you think I'll care if someone actually makes a mistake braiding hair and they blame me for that? That's going to be buried and everything else. And when it does come up and we allow people to braid hair and walk dogs and start businesses when they, when they normally wouldn't be able to, and we do this, and they say, well, Bob Jones braided hair and, and Sally, her hair was hurt and she's going to sue. Got it. Yes, one person messed it up. Meanwhile, 100 people started a new life. I'm okay with that. I'll, I'll take that every day of the week. Not just that, the Office of the Repeal. How many people can I, I'm sorry, the Office of the Pardon. How many people can I actually begin to pardon? The safe act. I'll just start pardoning a bunch of them. And I don't mean commute their sentences. I mean pardon them. I mean pardon them. Clean, it, clean the slate. Go off with your bad self. Right? So, of course, is someone who got convicted from the safe act going to do something stupid? Of course, because they're people, right? So if I pardon 100 people and one guy goes and robs a liquor store, they're going to say, Larry, this guy robbed a liquor store because you pardoned him. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. But 99 people didn't. And we actually were built on a country that said, I would rather have an innocent person, uh, I'm a guilty person go free than an innocent man be imprisoned. And I believe in that. So that's what I can do. And also, I can veto. I can veto, 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 veto veto and on top of that i can be the marketer in chief in case you didn't know i like talking i can be the guy who can be out here talking about exactly this and i will not stop this radio show i will do a radio show weekly i took this idea from uh, bloomberg and Giuliani back in uh, in new york they did it every week in, here in new york city i'll do this and i'll be able to talk to people and point people out and point out prosecutors and point out people look to be forward most of the police force that's that are enforcing these bad laws they don't want to do that most of them don't. They want to be fighting real criminals. That's why they became cops. It's the prosecutors that push them because they want convictions. I get that. I get that. And we'll deal with that. Thank you so much for that call. I appreciate it, my friend. Yep. All righty. I'm going to do a quick break, and I'll pick up some more uh, phone calls, and we'll be right back on The Governor's House. You're listening to The Talking Alternative Network. Are you stuck in a rut? Negative thoughts, feelings, and conversations got you down? Hi, I'm Noreen Sumter, The Potentiator. Tune in every Tuesday, 9 to 10 Eastern Time, and listen for new ideas on my show, Beyond Potential, Live Life Your Way, on talkradio.nyc. do you want to connect with? Are you an entrepreneur or intrapreneur looking to build your following? Welcome to our show. Follow, Follow Me Friday, Friday with Joan and Priya. Tune in every Friday at noon Eastern on talkradio.nyc. We're, We're your digital, digital connectors. connectors. Woo woo! <laughs> <laughs> Talking Alternative Radio, 24 hours a day.
Welcome back to the Governor's House. I'm Larry Sharp, running for Governor of New York in 2018. You want to know about, more about what I'm doing? LarrySharp.com. Sharp with an E, because E makes it special. You want to talk to me? 877-480-4120. I know we're uh, filling up the lines. I know they are actually packed. I'm going to grab as many calls as I can. If you can't get through, give it a couple minutes. Try again, because we are packing the lines up. So thank you so much for calling in. I want to touch a quick piece. I believe Larry Peter said, Talk to me about what happens if the guy who robs a liquor store shoots someone that I love. This is a, actually a silly question. People ask all the time. This, of course, if someone kills someone that I love, I want them to die. Of course I do. That doesn't make it right. I hope we're not going to pass laws based upon what I want. If, we, if, if I'm now the king, if I'm running for king, we can do what I want. Great. I'm going to pass a law with... Anyone named Larry Sharp can do whatever he wants. What a great law. I love that law. That would be amazing for me and a really bad idea. So just because I personally don't want it happening to me, just because I personally want to break the rules, doesn't mean we should make rules for me to break them. So I want you to realize that. I get what you're saying. And that's the old, well, what if the guy comes and gets your daughter or your son or your wife or your husband? Of course I'd be mad. Of course I'd want to break all the rules and, and shoot him myself. Of course I would. That doesn't mean we should have laws that way. The, the point is just an emotional, you know, charged question. So, yes, I'm human. Guilty as charged. But I don't want to be king. That's not what I'm running for. I'm running for governor. And I want people to be free. Hope that answers your question. All right. A couple of questions I want to grab. Gus. Gus is on line one. How are you, Gus? Hello, hello Mr. Sharp. Uh, I'm Gus from the state of Missouri. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I actually have two questions for you, if that's okay. You're being greedy. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, one, I was wondering, uh, what type of libertarian do you describe yourself as? A good and one. Two, what, what was your reaction to uh, the uh, head organizer of the LNC 2018 rejecting Ron Paul for, uh, uh, yep. to speak? Yep, absolutely. Now, um, it's funny. I, I, don't really, I generally don't classify myself as, as a type of libertarian. I usually let others do it, and I'm kind of okay. I think in my heart, I would love if I could be an anarchist. That would be amazing. I love the concept of it. I'm not sure it's realistic at all right now. Maybe, but I don't see it right now. Uh, but I'd love to be one. I think I, I maybe I'm closer to a anarchist now. I'm not sure. What I really want to do, my skill set that I have versus other people and skill sets they have, my skill set is bringing people to us so they can look at us and go, hmm, this might be the right answer. So I'm a libertarian who wants to turn the ship around from oligarchy towards freedom. That's the one I am. If I can turn the ship around, I'll let all those people who want to decide who they are do what they want the way they want to do it. And I'm happy that if we have factions when that comes. Right now, for us to fight over what type of libertarian we are, it's, it's, it's adjusting the deck chairs on the Titanic. That's what it is. I see. So I agree, and it's it's splitting the party too. Yes, absolutely. When it comes to Ron Paul, I like Ron Paul. I think if he were able to speak, that would be amazing. I think he'd bring more people to the convention. I think he'd bring more people to the party. I think it's great. But we have a lot of other problems. Before with you, I'm. It's not a big deal to me because we have a lot of other problems in our party. Tons of them. Our party, in many ways, is broken. We have a culture of failure, a culture of losing, a culture of not believing anyone, a culture of tearing each other down. Haven't you seen how many times someone becomes in any way, shape, or form popular and they start going, Celebritarian, and they start beating him up and calling him names constantly. And they try to find a reason to make that person fail constantly. They even get mad at me because I won't do that. Right? I, I actually try to help people. I look, Arvin and I had a fight. For those of you who don't know, Arvin Bora was the vice or is the vice chair. Hopefully soon we was. Um, Floridian slip is the vice chair of the LNC. He and him and I, we had a spat back and forth. Absolutely. And I said publicly, I'd still vote for him if he was running in my state because he's a libertarian. If he was running in my state, I would flee from his campaign because it would be a dumpster fire on wheels. However, if he was actually on the ballot. He's getting my vote because he would make government smaller and he's a libertarian. So even when him and I are, were fighting, I'm still not going to tear him down like that. I'm still going to vote for him if he, if, he, if he ran. I'm trying my best, as you know, if you follow me. I cross the country raising money for lots of libertarians. I don't agree with every one of them. Of course not. They don't all agree with me. Of course not. I raise for parties with chairs who I'm sure hate me. I don't care. 
I'm still trying to raise money, and I'm trying to build a culture of sharing. I'm trying to build a culture of support. The other parties do it, and so should we. So I'm, I'm, I'm not prepared to fight a battle over Ron Paul. I do, it would be great if he came, and if he comes, that's great. If he doesn't, let's start fixing our own party first. Maybe it's better if he comes when we're maybe more squared away. I hope I answered your question. All righty. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Thank you. Sharp. Have you a great day. A, a lot of my questions, even though I, I, well. That's a yes or is that a no? I can't tell. <laughs> I'm going to say it's a yes. Thanks. <laughs> Have a good one. All right. I'll put you down for yes. All right. So, Christopher, line two, how are you? I'm well. Yourself, Larry? I am rocking and rolling. Tired from my trip, but I, I got back from Albany today around 630, and I'm here. So I'm tired, but I had to keep going. All right, I'd like to speak to you about something that happened at the end of 2012 and 2013 okay. in the Department of Motor Vehicles. Are you aware of what they are now deeming as permanent revocation? Yes, uh, I am, and I actually put my policy team on this. Was it you who reached out to me? Either you or someone else reached out to me through the page, and I uh, appreciate that. Facebook, yes. It was you. I myself you. have personally been sitting down with my local assembly people, um, my local senator. I've been to Albany when they had the Court of Appeals case this past year, uh, last March, yep. and there are literally what has happened is a whole new social demographic of people here in New York have been left trying to wrap their heads around what are we going to do for the rest of our lives. Yes. I myself personally come with about a phone book thick stack of documentation that I've done my time. Yes. I've done my Look, treatment. No Christopher, no longer needed. Christopher, I'm 10 years sober, stay with like, me, brother. I, yes, yes. I, I, I'm with you, and let me be very clear on two things. One, I took what you sent me seriously, and I literally put my policy team on it, and we're going to have a phone call on Monday about that issue. So we're going to sit. We done, we're doing a homework on it now, so that we know what's going on. We're going to have a call on Monday, this coming Monday, about that. And if it's what I think it is, it may be my topic for next Wednesday. So be clear. I I took it seriously. My team is on it. Let me give you my my view on it in theory. Unless someone has a serious problem that will threaten others in perpetuity, no punishment should go on in perpetuity without exception. Thank you. So unless you have an affliction or some issue that is going to threaten people in perpetuity, no punishment should be in perpetuity. If, if it is, it is by default cruel and unusual. We need to become a nation of second chances. That doesn't mean you don't punish people. People make mistakes. We can punish them. I got it. But we need to be a nation of second chances. People came here for a second chance. People came here because they wanted to make things happen. Our biggest success stories are all people have second chances. But it's the most important, Christopher. Guys like you, when you get your chance, you're not going to blow it because you really want it. And I'll go one step further. Guys like you, you become the crusaders. You become the ones who help others. Because something I know to be true, and so does everyone listening knows it to be true. The most zealous are the converted. Those who have seen the light and whatever that is and decide to then become that next thing, they become great. So when you told me your story, Christopher, I believed you. I assumed you were a crusader. I assumed you were someone who was exactly that. I assumed you were someone who was going to be great and you wanted a second chance. And I took it seriously. And as I said, I remember that's why I mentioned this because I know you reached out to me. I will have a phone call on Monday about this issue with my policy team. And I will let you know what we're thinking hopefully by Wednesday, and we'll have a policy. The problem is this, to me, um, to be forward with you, this was an, an obscure issue for me. I didn't know about it. So you letting me know is the first time I really got it. So I hope that is clear. I took it seriously. I was listening to you. And one of the reasons why I'm, I'm still trying my best to be active on social media, why I'm still doing this, is for exactly this. I don't want to be a guy who is so out of touch that no one gets it. It's funny. I was in Albany today, and I was talking to some people, uh, some press people. I don't, uh, press people, I don't want to use their name because they might get mad at me. But they said, you know, we don't see the governor anymore. This is his city. <laughs> they don't see him. He doesn't come around anymore. He is completely detached. I don't want to become that guy, right? I don't want to become that guy ever. I remember when I was in Marine Corps years ago, I had a uh, lieutenant colonel who was, one of, was my battalion commander, and he said... Larry never, he didn't say Larry, he said Sergeant Sharp. He said, Sergeant Sharp, please never forget, there's some value in LBWA. And I said, LBWA? 
He said, yeah, leadership by walking around. And what he meant by that is go meet your team always. Go meet people always. Go talk to people always. And there's 18 million New Yorkers. I can't talk to you all. I tr I'll try, but I can at least put myself out there so you can touch me. And my team will be able to touch you so you guys can touch us also. If you didn't notice uh, on my uh, Facebook page, I met a couple business owners in upstate. And both cases, I shook their hands, took a picture, promote, promote their business a little bit, right? Why not? Take a shot. Promote your business, right? We want local business, businesses and family businesses to know who their governor is. They're the ones creating jobs. They're the ones paying taxes. They're the ones living here. I want to be able to touch them. So I know I talked a lot, Christopher. That's what I do. Sorry. But I hope I at least let you know that I was listening, paying attention, and that it does matter to me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And I look forward to being in touch with you because this is an issue that doesn't only just deal with me personally. It's literally 20,000 people or more, their families, their children, their livelihood here in New York. And we definitely need somebody to take a stand and be proactive on it. Absolutely. Well, I hope I can be that guy. Thank you, sir. All righty. Have a great night. All right. So, all right. I just got a little piece here. It says uh, Alex Merced for new LNC vice chair. Yeah, that'd be a pretty good idea. Now, to be clear, I'm pretty biased. He's my policy chief. So clearly I'm biased. But if you got to think someone who... Who, who knows policy? Yeah. In fact, he's the one I told Christopher. Literally, it was Alex Merced. He's the guy I said, hey, can we do this on Monday and, and fix the situation? So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit uh, biased. Absolutely. So, go ahead, Brian. You have a question? Fast, yeah. Tyler wants to know, when will you be in Rochester? Ah, yes. I will be in the Rochester slash Buffalo area. I will be in that area um, from March 3rd through March 7th. I'm not sure exactly what day I'll be in Rochester and what day I'll be in Buffalo, but I'll be up in that area March 3rd through March 7th. If you want to see me, keep paying attention to my event page. If you think there's something that I should be doing when I'm up there, please let me know. Is there an event I should attend? Is there some group of people who might want to talk to me? Is there a college that wants to hear me talk about something? Whatever you think is appropriate, let me know. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. All right, guys, if you want to talk, some of the phone lines are open now. If you want to call in, great, 877-480-4120. I will talk to you right after the break. You are listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Are you into comics, movies, and pop culture at large? What about music and TV? Then you're in for a treat. This is Michael Dolce, your host on TalkingAlternative.com. I've been professionally writing comic books, screenplays, and music articles for almost 15 years. Catch my show, Secrets of the Sire, at its new primetime slot, Wednesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and get the inside scoop on the pop culture universe you love to talk about. For more info, go to SecretsOfTheSire.com. Talking Alternative Radio, 24 hours a day. Welcome back to the Governor's House. It's Larry Sharp running for Governor of New York in 2018. If you want to see what I'm doing, great. Go to the Facebook page, Larry Sharp for New York. Sharp with an E. Or head over to LarrySharp.com. Again, Sharp with an E. Go there. See what I'm doing. Read the blog. There's a lot of cool stuff there. Watch the videos. But most importantly, donate. It's important that you donate. This takes money. This takes time. It takes energy. And if you like what I'm doing, if you think that I have a chance at victory, and I do, if you think I have a chance at victory, then it's time for you to help me out. Go there, donate. Monthly donations are always the best. But hey, if you can't do monthly, no worries. Do what you can. 100 bucks is awesome. 500 is amazing. But even 25 or 50 will do. Whatever we can, whatever we can do will help tremendously. All right, I'm going to take a couple of uh, questions. Uh, Brian, give me a couple of questions. So Curtis asks, why is the Second Amendment the only regulated right? Is that true? I don't think it is. I don't think it is true. Um, but it definitely is regulated for a very emotional reason. Uh, 
people lose their children over that. So, yeah, I mean, that's the reason why it's regulated, because people lose their children over it, of course. But there's a second issue, too, and that is if a lot of people have guns, there is a fear that government won't have control, and government wants to have control. I get that. It, it makes sense, right? Because if I want to be in government, I tend to want to control people. I know it sounds bad, but it's often true. What we have to do is we have to understand something here. And for those of you who are following what I'm doing, this is very special. Many of the answers that I have for questions aren't the actual way of solving the problem. I'm going to say that again. Many times when people ask me a question on how to solve something, I don't have the direct answer. I'm not supposed to. I shouldn't. I can't. How can I know everything? I mean, I am super smart. That's true. But I'm not, I don't know everything. I'm not omniscient. Of course not. How could I be? I'm kidding. I'm not that smart. Anyway, uh, how could I possibly know that? It is impossible, right? This is what is called in my business world, which is why I, I, I so just absorb the libertarian principles. In my business world, we have to move away from what I, what I always call industrial leadership. And that is the idea where I need to know everything as a boss and tell you what to do and you do exactly what I tell you to do. That's old school thinking. And that was very good when it came to, you know, school districts, right? Well, I, I grade school. My school teaches me to sit in a room and do what I'm told because when I'm 18, I'm going to go into a factory and sit in a room and do what I'm told. Well done. Perfect. Those days are over. Those days are over. I was on a, a radio show. And a guy asked me, he said, Larry, he said, you libertarians, people think it's going to be crazy when you win. You know, how do you know you could actually govern? Where's the proof? I said, easy. Every successful business on the planet today is run by a libertarian. Everyone. Every successful business on the planet today is run by a libertarian. They may not know the libertarians, but they are because their leadership style is not iron fist because it was iron fist. They're not successful. That's not how it works. I know I trained them. It's not how it works. How it works is they give, they give some leeway to their people. You find those businesses that just can't get past that place, you just can't move, very often you have an iron fist leader, a centralized control leader, a I need to know everything leader, a leader who can't delegate. That's what you have. That's why those businesses stagnate. That's why they call me in. That's how I know that. Government is no different. Centralized control doesn't work. You think it would work? Ask the USSR how well that worked. Not so much. Not so much. Centralized control doesn't work. Not today anymore. I need people to want to buy in. And that's what I'm trying to achieve. We are on the vanguard of this idea. It's funny when I say that, people go, yeah, that actually makes sense. Larry can't know everything. How could he? Yes, government has to move away from being an enforcer and now into the area of being a facilitator. Where now we are allowing people to do things that are great, helping people do things that are great, helping them come up with answers helping them figure things out. That's the issue. But when we just make rules, 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 we have a problem. I'll give you an example. Some of you know from one of my shows years ago, other years ago, well, actually one was years ago, but in this case, I'm talking just a couple of weeks ago. I talked about the, the problem with zero tolerance. Zero tolerance is the perfect example of we're going to make so many rules so harsh, we'll fix everything. Zero tolerance always makes things worse. Let me say that one more time. Zero tolerance always makes things worse. There's no exception. The problem is, at first, it looks good because we've done something. We feel awesome. Look, we did something. We put in a rule. And now, look, no one is doing anything bad. No, no one's reporting anything because it's zero tolerance. No one will even say anything because it's zero tolerance. In fact, now the victims of whatever this thing is, they don't want to say anything because their friend or coworker or boss might get fired now. So even the victims are quiet. So everything goes in the ground, people stay afraid, and everything is bad. Why do you think so many women, when it came to the, the uh, issues with uh, harassment, waited 20 or 30 years before they spoke? Because they had forgotten? No. Because it, it was okay, it just bothered them now? No. Because it was zero tolerance even back then? No. Bad idea. I want people to be able to be open and deal with their issues and fix issues. I don't want short-term solutions. You guys are going to hear me say this all the time, and i got to keep saying it. With very few exceptions, at the end of every law, 
is a guy or a gal with a gun who will put you in a cage. Law is force. Government is force. Does that mean we shouldn't use force? Of course not. You shouldn't use force if you want to. It doesn't mean that at all. It means use force when there is a victim, to protect the victim, when there's a threat of violence, someone taking away your rights, taking away your liberty, taking away your freedom, taking away your property, taking away your health. Yeah, that's completely okay. I get it. I was on a show today, and a woman was asking me about marijuana. And I said, okay, let me ask you a question. There was a guy next to us, and I said, this, this handsome man next to us. I said, he has, it wasn't me. I'm a handsome man, but it wasn't me. Another, another guy, also handsome. I'm not the only handsome guy around. You should know that. So I went to that, I said, that handsome man, he has a marijuana cigarette in his mouth. He has a joint in his mouth. Would it be okay for you personally, do you think it is okay for you personally to go to that guy, slap him in the face, grab that cigarette, and throw it in the garbage? Is that okay? She went, no. I said, then why is it okay for cops? Why is it okay for cops? Cops are simply outsourced us, right? That's what they are. They're outsourced us. They're us policing ourselves, but we outsource it to the government. Why are they special? And the funny thing is, the vast majority of cops don't want to grab that marijuana cigarette and even police it at all. They want to fight real criminals. They want to stop real crimes. They want to be the tough, super tough guys and the superheroes that they wanted to be. And they saw on TV and they saw in their family and friends who were also police officers. I know my father was a cop. I get it. They want to be that guy. They don't want to be a guy policing marijuana, but they have to. And they shouldn't. It's only going to make them feel bad. Anyway, next question. Jacob wants to know, now that we know you can't answer any questions properly, uh, what is your stance on the Excelsior Scholarship and how do we fix tuition costs in New York State? Yeah, there, there are so many issues with this one. I wish it was just one answer. It isn't. It's several. One of them is breaking the, the, breaking the whole the Board of Regents on our colleges. The Board of Regents is one of the things that New York State does very well, which is create councils and, and departments and divisions and groups and committees um, that no one actually runs, that no one's responsible for. Well, we don't know what to do with marijuana. Well, what does uh, King Andrew say? He says, well, I know what we do. We'll create a panel to discuss things, to talk about this, to maybe do so-and-so. You've been governor for seven years, and now you're thinking about a panel to talk about doing something to maybe... This is a common problem. And one of those perfect examples is the Board of Regents. It is a, a board that people are selected to, appointed to, a piece from here, a piece from there. And the concept is, well, you know what? This will make sure that, that there's no one being too corrupt. The opposite is true. What actually happens is all these boards, all these departments, all these corporations, I'm doing air quotes now, hold on. All these corporations, right? All these guys, all they really are are they're farms for corruption. They're farms for crony capitalism. So the first thing to do is take out a way to make all the teeth away out of the Board of Regents. Number one, allow colleges and universities to do whatever they want as long as it's transparent. And I want to say it again, whatever they want to do when it comes to their curriculum should have nothing to do with the Board of Regents at all. The Board of Regents should only be a clearinghouse for information, should only be a place where you can get data, should only be a warehouse, Absolutely okay with all those things. Zero ability to do anything to include to our uh, K through 12. So first step, that's the first step. Second step, we've got to not just do that, but we've got to allow kids to not get college for free because that makes it worse, but instead to have options for kids. They're already doing it right now in, um, in uh, Syracuse. It's called CTE, if I'm not mistaken. It's something technical education or something like that. Someone who knows can help me out with what that is. I forgot what it is. CTE is what it is. And it's a way to get kids to start getting into schools, so get into jobs right away, working in their fields immediately. So they don't even have to go to college for that. But once we get rid of the Board of Regents in general, now colleges come up with whatever they want. They can do a, a degree in, I don't know, what's the cool thing to have degrees in? Degrees in making apps. Is that a cool thing? Whatever. I don't have to know again. I don't think that's what they call it. But yeah, they I don't think call that's it a good, degree yeah, in good making one. apps. No, I don't think that's, maybe. Whatever. Maybe. My point is, again, I don't have to know. I have to give them the freedom to do what they think is appropriate. The next piece is we've got to find a way at the federal level, and this is going to be so hard, to deal with the loans. Oh. This is going to be a monster, and I wish it was easy. It is a lot of 
getting through. There are so many people who are making money off of these loans and putting our kids in debt for two hundred, one hundred, three hundred thousand dollars, and they never get rid of it. There's there's a point where I think it was Goldman Sachs maybe did a study and actually said that unless you're going to an Ivy League school, you probably shouldn't go to college anymore because the debt that you incur going to school destroys so many opportunity costs for you that you actually can't, it's not worth it. You, you'd be better off just getting a job, right? Because of the opportunity costs. So I guess at the same, at the same time, I'm sorry, Jacob, thank you. Career technical education, that's CTE. Thank you. Career technical education. Thank you. So yeah, let me go back. Uh, the, the first thing to remember here is if we allow the schools to do what they, what they need to do and remove free college, things will change. There are so many people who are making money off of the backs of the students. And here's what they say. Larry, if we don't control this, then there'll be fraud. There'll be Trump University. There was Trump University with it. Didn't change. But I'll say something that you might not want to hear. There's a whole lot of degrees that are actually fraud. Why? Because people thought that as soon as they got that degree, there'd be a job waiting for them. And they're a barista at Starbucks. I'm not teasing. That's true. I know many of them here in New York City. They are actually baristas at Starbucks and they have advanced degrees. Is that not fraud? And now they're $200,000 in debt and they have to have three roommates. Is that not fraud? Well, people I see upstate New York who live with their parents still when they're 30 and they have a degree, but they can't get a good job. Is that not fraud? So this is a big problem. Thank you for that question. It's seven or eight different steps to make it work, but the most important piece is doing what I'm doing now, being the marketer in chief, being using the bully pulpit to talk about this, let the people know it's the right answer, and then to create state ways of blocking the federal government when it comes to in debt making our children, indebting our children. The problem is I don't want children staying in New York because they can't afford to leave. That's the wrong way. That's what the Excelsior program does, by the way. It makes sure the kids can't leave because they can't afford to leave. So does the debt that's being put upon them, right? I want them to not leave because they want to stay, because they love their family and their friends and their opportunity and their business, and they, they want to be here. That's why I want them to stay. The Excelsior program does something else. It says, why don't you apply, and maybe you'll make it. Well, if you apply and don't make it, it's kind of too late to go someplace else, isn't it? So you're still stuck in New York. So the ability of to, just to apply means you got to stay, so you're stuck, number one. Where are you going to go now? You've already applied here. You're, you're trying to stay here. If you get a yes, awesome for you, but for every year you go to college free, you have to stay in New York or it becomes a loan. What's the difference then? What if there's no opportunity in New York? What are you going to do? You're going to lie. That's going to happen. We are increasing the idea and the, and, the, and the opportunity for someone to be corrupt. If I'm a youngster, and look, you all know this. This is just common sense. I'm a 22-year-old. I just got a degree in marketing, whatever my degree is in, and I get a great job in, in Pittsburgh. I'm going. I'm going to Pittsburgh for my great job that I want to go to. I'm going to lie, and I'm going to tell people that my parents, I'm living in my parents' house. I'm not living in Pittsburgh. I live in my parents' house. And when that happens, now we have to have the the school police who go to check houses door to door. What is mom going to lie? And this is lying to the government. Is mom a felon now for lying? Is that the rule? Am I a felon? Is that perjury now because we lied in a, on, a, on a government form? What is that now? I don't know, but it's bad no matter what. And then what happens? Now I have to pay the loan? Well, now I can't afford to live in Pittsburgh anymore on that same salary. So now I lose that job. Now I've got to quit. My resume is broken. I'm in debt. I'm back home with mom. That's the Excelsior program. I'm not impressed. LarrySharp.com, L-A-R-R-Y-S-H-A-R-P-E. Go donate. Talk to you after the break. You are listening to the Talking Alternative Network. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? 
I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you feeling unhappy with your body, shape, or size? Ever feel out of control with food? I'm Elizabeth from Nourish the Soul, and on this show, you will uncover the root to these imbalances and discover a permanent solution to having a healthy relationship to food and your body. Join us every Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on talkradio.nyc. TalkingAlternative.com It is Larry Sharp. I am here at the Governor's House, 877-480-4120. Head over to LarrySharp.com and donate. You like what you're hearing. You want to have access to me more and more. You want me to be the vanguard and tip the spear for the next person running for governor in your state. Then donate. Help out. LarrySharp.com. Give what you can. 500 is amazing if you can do that. 250 is good. 100 is good. 50 is good. All good. Whatever you can do. We could use the help. All right. Um, question. We have a question? Yeah, sure. No, we have tons of them. <laughs> Lots like of questions. It. All right. So when does the official race between you and Cuomo begin? Ah, yes. Um, it began last July. Yes. I've been telling people that it's only me or Cuomo. I've been telling them that for months, and I've been right then, and I'm right now, and I'll be right three months from now when I keep saying it. Um, the race is now, and I'm up already doing what I have to do to run. And you guys who are paying attention, you know, Cuomo raised the most amount of money, 12 million big ones, and I raised six figures. I've actually spent more money than all three of the other Republican challengers raised. I spent more. I'm pushing 150K now already. So I'm on my way to getting what I need to to, to, to win this thing. You might say, but Larry, you'll never outspend uh, Cuomo. You're right. I won't, and I don't have to. All I have to do is get enough to get across the state enough times for people to hear my message. Because once he sees that, he'll attack me. When he attacks me, I win. So that's what I need to do. I don't have to get more money than him. Remember, New York State's a plurality state. I just need more than the rest. The Republicans are going to lose. They can't win. They have zero chance in a statewide election in 2018 in New York. How do I know that? Uh, that their, their top guy who was going to win and be the great guy he saw our numbers from uh, January when we were beating everybody, and he dropped out. So he's gone. He's like, I can't be these guys. I am wasting my time. What the hell am I doing? He dropped out. So they're in trouble. And so the race began already. It's been there. Most of them haven't figured this out yet. I have. I'm already playing the game. I'm already, I'm already running. I know that I'm behind, but I got to run now. So I'm running. So we're good. Thank you for that. So you call. Um, is this Gus? Yeah, hey, uh, uh, Mr. Sharp. Uh, I know that uh, I called earlier, but there was one more question. I oh, I have, to, I have to hang up on you then. No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> but uh, let's see. Uh, I got to remember what it was real quick. Oh, yeah. yeah um, real quick. Governor Cuomo has, uh, in the past, voiced support for Puerto Rico statehood mm -hmm. and uh, been a firm supporter of Puerto Rico. When you become the next governor of New York, will you do the same thing and help support other territories in D.C. as well? Or is that something you're planning on changing? No, I, to be forward with you, this is not one of my top priorities. Not that I wouldn't be supportive, but it's not a top priority. There are so many problems with our state worrying about Puerto Rico and D.C. and Guam and the Virgin Islands and the Samoans. And I mean, it's, it's, it's important, yes, but that's really a federal issue, if that makes any sense. So it's not going to be high on my priorities. But if someone asks me, here is what I think. I think we shouldn't have any territories. None. 
I think we should try to make everyone either a state or an independent nation. Because in my, my the problem I have with it is it's like DC. They're actually taxation without representation. That's what Guam is. That's what Puerto Rico is. And I know many of them like it, and I get it. I understand why they like it. If I'm Guam, I'd probably like having it too. I get it. But it's not what this country was based upon. It's not an important issue for me. And I'm not going to push it in any way, shape, or form. But if someone asked me, my support would be we should try to make these territories either states or independent nations, whatever their people want, and we should do this as quickly as possible because right now they have taxation without representation, and I'm not happy about that. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes. Yes, uh, thank you for answering another one of my questions, uh, future Governor Sharp. I, oh, well, I uh, thank keep you. saying that. I'm going to keep answering questions. I love that. Thank you. All right, good. Yeah. <laughs> Brian, do you have another question? Yes. Um, Andrew asks, do you think getting Elon Musk and other business types to endorse you for governor would help? I think absolutely, if I could get that, yes. And I think many of them uh, think the same way I do. The problem is... Many of them already have put their their uh, their eggs in a basket, right? So they already kind of have made themselves, you know, they, they live X or they live Y, left or right. Many of them have. So it's difficult to make that happen. But, yes, I think it would be great. I'm not sure if Elon Musk himself would be great for New York. He has had a checkered past with, with our state. Uh, so I'm not sure he necessarily would be the right one. But someone like a Mark Cuban, someone like a Jeff Bezos, Someone like, uh, I don't know, Patrick Burns, those people, they would be amazing. So, yes, I would love those types. They'd be awesome. Um, and I do talk to them, by, by the way. Not all of them, but my, myself and my team, we talk to their people. We talk to them, and we'd love to have them to support us. And maybe we will. There, there are some prominent uh, people who either lean libertarian or libertarian. Kurt Russell, Vince Vaughn, uh, Patrick Burns, as I already mentioned. Um, Mark Cuban, maybe. Depends on the day. He's gone back and forth. Um, so, yeah. Um, so some of them are. Uh, Drew Carey, uh, so uh, Penn Jillette, lots of them who are celebrities, they, they do lean. So would they endorse me? Maybe. We'll see. I, I appreciate the question. Do you know any of them? Can you put in a good word? I would love that if you could. So, of course, endorsements would be great. But to be forward with you, I haven't been pushing for endorsements yet. And there's a reason why. One, it's a little early. Number one, not that many, not that many people are even interested yet. And they still think that maybe someone else might come in and do something. Some people still think that they're wrong, but that's okay. They can think that. And the second piece is I want to be a bit, I want to be a bit more well known within the state so that when those endorsements come, they'll be more powerful and they will land. So I haven't really pushed it that much. I'll probably push it more after April when, you know, in April 21st, those of you who don't know, in April uh, 21st, uh, I will actually get the nomination officially and be the official libertarian candidate when that happens now okay maybe i should stop pushing for endorsements so i, I hope that answers your question i would like to do it of course andrew asks do you know of any blind spots that cuomo and the hard left could attack you on but they're blind right i don't so i don't know how, how you see them I already know if they're blind yes i have magic powers uh, I, I don't know i guess it, there's one thing I hope you see in me. I hope all of you see this. I go out of my way to be transparent. I go out of my way to just show you who I am, open up what I do, be who I am, and take the chance that I'll make a mistake. You guys see me speak? Have you ever seen me speak with notes? Has I mean, I've been speaking in public for two years on this. I don't remember ever using notes. I don't really use them because I just speak off the cuff. So I say what I feel, I say what I think is right, and when I'm wrong, and I have been wrong, I admit when I'm wrong, I hear people and I listen. Sometimes I change my mind because I get, oh, you know what, that's wrong, I, I made a mistake, it does happen. I try just to be open, so I'm pretty much transparent. If some of you saw when I ran for uh, VP in 2016 for the VP nomination of the Libertarian Party, I, I put out a, a nine-minute video that basically put all my dirty laundry right out into the street. I did it right away so that people saw this is who I am. I'm a flawed man. That's who I am. I think I'm a caring person. I think I'm smart. And I think I, I want to make things work better, but I'm by no means perfect. In, in, in no way am I the, the guy who you might think is going to be magical. I wish I was, but I'm actually now I'm glad I'm not. So I don't wish I was. That's not true. I'm glad I'm not. So I don't think they would, but if they had, if there's a blind spot, they come up and say, Larry, you're this bad thing. If I am that bad thing, 
I'll admit that I'm that bad thing. And I hope I'm not it anymore. And I hope I've learned and become that, uh, that zealot I spoke about earlier. I hope I've become that zealot and I'm no longer that bad thing, whatever I was. So maybe, but to be full with you, I'm not concerned. And a lot of people tell me, and they all try to, they're very funny. They all try to tell me, Larry, you know, they're going to beat you up bad. You know, Larry, they're going to get you. Whatever. I know that. You think I don't know that? You think I don't watch TV? Of course. I signed up for this. They're going to hammer me all day, all night. They do now. Right? People ask me all the time, what happens about, uh, you know, I, I, people insulting you? The most dismissive is always the left. They're the most dismissive. You're an idiot. You don't know anything dismissive. The right is the most vulgar. They always vulgar at me. Nasty and vulgar. Even racial slurs. Always nasty. But the most consistent? Libertarians. Boy, they just keep on hammering. They are the most consistent. But I get them all, no matter what. So... Uh, that probably did not answer your question, but that's okay. I I, I hope it was a, a good answer anyway. Yeah, real fast. Um, a couple of people have asked about correction officer contracts and how you would deal with the the lapsed correction officer contracts. Yeah, this say. is another issue. In general, this goes right along with the pension uh, bomb. We are going to have to do some good renegotiating. If we don't renegotiate what's happening, what's going to happen is either New York State is going to default on this stuff, which is a disaster. I don't want that. Or pension insurance is going to kick in. Everyone's going to get a 30% of their pension and 70% discount on their pensions. I don't want either of those things. When it comes to all these things, we have to renegotiate immediately. You know, we can't have six, seven, eight tiers in unions. It just doesn't work. It's not going to work. We have to change that entire system. The first thing when it comes to correction officers is talking with them to figure out what's the future. How do we make this sustainable? I don't want to solve this for two years and then be fighting again in two more years. Also, for five years, how awesome are we? And be fighting again in five years. I wish there was an easy answer. It isn't. But here's what I promise you. It is not easy, but I will tackle it. That I promise you. I will tackle that issue. I will have strict negotiations with the unions and with the state. We will talk back and forth and we'll find a sustainable answer. That I promise. It's hard. All right, guys. Larry Sharp, The Governor's House, LarrySharp.com, Larry Sharp for New York. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching to The Governor's House. I will see you next week. You're listening to the Talking Alternative Network.